Granthadaj Srimad Bhagavatam. This is the first canto, and we're on chapter 16, which describes how Parikshit received the age of Kali. Um, have we been studying this sequentially so everybody knows what the context is from the past chapter? Yeah, okay. So the past chapter, the Pandavas retired. This is just after the departure of Lord Krishna. And now Parikshit has ascended onto the throne. And we're going to see what happened. <clears throat> just in the interest of saving time, I think I'll skip the Sanskrit unless it's really juicy. And I'll, then I'll recite it. So <clears throat> in text one, Sutta Goswami said, O learned Brahmanas, Maharaj Parikshit then began to rule over the world as a great devotee of the Lord under the instructions of the best of the twice-born Brahmanas. He ruled by those great qualities which were foretold by expert astrologers at the time of his birth. King Parikshit married the daughter of King Uttara and begot four sons headed by Maharaj Janamejaya. Maharaj Parikshit, after having selected Kripacharya for guidance as his spiritual master, performed three horse sacrifices on the banks of the Ganges. These were executed with sufficient rewards for the attendants, and at these sacrifices, even the common man could see demigods. Once, when Maharaj Parikshit was on his way to conquer the world, he saw the master of Kali Yuga, who was lower than a Shudra, Described, uh, I'm sorry, disguised as a king and herding the legs of a cow and bull. The king at once caught hold of him to deal sufficient punishment. <clears throat> uh, there's a nice purport here by, I've already warned you, now you're going to be fined. Okay, then you're excused. Thank you. <clears throat> There's a nice purport here by Srila Prabhupada who writes, The purpose of a king's going out to conquer the world is not for self-aggrandizement. This is a foreign concept in the modern world, isn't it? G generally, we postulate that the purpose of any, well, just like now we're engaged in, a, in warfare on the other side of the planet, so that you don't have to pay more than $3 for your gas. Because the government has to deal with people who are uptight about that sort of thing. And um, there are other uh, factors involved we can imagine. And in fact, we have to imagine because you're never going to read about it in the newspapers. But that's another matter. So this is the first thing, that in days where Dharma was not so eroded as it is now, people actually, there were actually a class of people who were concerned first, first and foremost with religious principles. Nowadays, people have become so cynical and jaded and conditioned by the degradation of this age, that if you make any appeal to virtue, the person sees you as very quaint, naive, right? And you're not taken seriously. Uh, that is the general tenor of that. That is the psychological, that is the psyche of the age, we can say. <clears throat> anyway, Maharaj Pariksit was the emperor of the world and all small states were ready under his, were already under his regime. His purpose in going out was to see how things were going on in terms of the godly state. The king, being the representative of the Lord, has to execute the will of the Lord, duly. There is no question of self-aggrandizement. Thus, as soon as Maharaj Parikshit saw that a lower-class man in the dress of a king was hurting the legs of a cow and bull, he at once arrested and punished him. The king cannot tolerate insults to the most important animal, the cow nor can he tolerate disrespect for the most important man, the Brahmana. Human civilization means to advance the cause of Brahminical culture, and to maintain it, cow protection is essential. Brahminical culture can advance only when man is educated to develop the quality of goodness. What do we call the quality of goodness in Sanskrit? Sattva guna. And that may, probably makes more sense to this audience than the mode of goodness. So, <clears throat> for this, there is a prime necessity of food prepared with milk, fruits, and grains. The Maharaj Parikshit was astonished to see that a black shudra dressed like a ruler was mistreating a cow, the most important animal in human society. The age of Kali means mismanagement and quarrel. Kalaha. 
leaves the Kali. And the root cause of all mismanagement and quarrel is that a worthless man is that worthless men with the modes of lower class men who have no higher ambition in life come to the helm of the state management. Or they replace the state, the relevance of the state management. This is maybe more relevant nowadays. They replace the relevance of state management with the relevance of corporate management. Because many sociologists would agree that corporations have virtually replaced the nation state as, a, as a, the most influential paradigm of management in the modern world. <clears throat> so these are some things to think about. Such men at the, post, uh, at the post of a king are sure to first hurt the cow and the Brahminical culture, thereby pushing all society towards hell. Because unless you have a, an agrarian-based society in which people are satisfied to live simply and think high, um, you cannot really have the kinds of virtue permeating society that gives rise to sinlessness. People, it's pretty much universally observed, I think. At least this has been reported for at least a hundred years or more, that there is a pretty clear uh, correlation between urban cent urbanization, urban culture, if you will, and degradation of moral values. When India first got independence long ago, 50 years ago, then there was, there was this whole concern about, at least in Hindi literature, it's represented that there was this whole clash between those who were pushing for the agrarian ideals that uh, Mahatma Gandhi exploited in order to win the position that he got, and the urbanization that his so-called uh, disciples, like Nehru and others, were pushing for just sub after his demise. So, and it's common experience also that if you go to a place, say like a small village in Iowa, here in North America, then you people are generally going to be very nice there. You've been there, so you know, he can, he's raising his hand, he's confirming this point. Whereas if you go to a place like South Central Los Angeles, well, you don't go there. <laughs> right here in Dallas, I, did I mention this on Sunday? There was one man who was watching television um, with his family late at night. His family then went to bed and he stayed up a little later. And he was not in the country long enough to know that you don't answer your door after a certain hour. Because as soon as he did so, the first thing he saw was the flash of a gun in his face. And that was the last thing he saw as well. He was instantly dead. And then they went in and tied up all of his family members, robbed everything they wanted and left. Uh, for luckily, they weren't killed either. But this is what happens. So people, are, people tend to be nicer where you are more in touch with nature, where you're not depending uh, as much on, well, I don't know what kind of stores you have out here. You have Kroger's here? Albertsons you have at least. See, this is where we're conditioned to, to assume that everything comes shrink-wrapped and, and pre-produced. And don't ask questions about how healthy it is or whether it's genetically modified or uh, any of the other factors that go into its production. They call it Franken-food sometimes. People become monsters when they... Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, anybody know the verse I'm thinking of? Yajnishishtashina santo muchante sarvakilbishe bhunjate te tu agham papam ye pachanti atma karanat. Those people who are cooking only for themselves and the people at these food processing plants, they're only thinking about their paycheck, if not worse. <laughs> uh, that's what's on the mind. So the consciousness goes into what you're eating. Uh, George Bernard Shaw said, you are what you eat. That's pretty clear. Um, not only you are what you eat, actually, but the principle of Sangha, mentioned in Sankhya philosophy and throughout the Vedic literature, it's infinitely subtle. We really don't have a clear idea of just how subtle it gets. It's not only what you eat, it's what you think, it's what you hear, it's what you touch, it's what you smell, everything, you see. Therefore, the Upanishads repeatedly advise us, what is that? Mm. See auspicious things, hear auspicious things, anybody know? Offhand, it's escaping me.
Pirache. Um, anyway, go on. A uh, very, very nice verse in the Sanskrit, which I can't remember right now, but <clears throat> this is the idea. So Maharaj Parikshit, therefore, as a question of his social responsibility and certainly his political responsibility, was concerned first and foremost with dharma and not only his own dharma, but with the dharma of the citizens, because that, that is the real, that is the dharma of the king, to think about everyone else's dharma. So he wasn't just uh, out there trying to get, uh, keep the, the, the price of gas low. He was out there trying to do some other things as well. Uh, let's, that's text five. Let's go on. Shonakarishi asked at this point, why did Maharaj Parikshit simply punish him instead of kill him? He was, this is unheard of in those days. Even when I was a kid, uh, the kinds of things that you see commonly now here in America, I grew up in Los Angeles. Um, you, you just, you didn't see them. Even, even in those days, it was kind of, it was considered risque if someone got a divorce. You know, now even in India, this anything goes into yeah, India, practically speaking, is worse, <laughs> even sometimes I think. But um, yeah, so this is the idea that things degrade very quickly and hard to say whether really things come uh, there. There are high and low tides within the general pattern of degradation. I don't really know, but it certainly looks that way. So it was so astonishing to see that this was even happening at all. Um, he, 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 so Shanakarishi inquired, why, why was, why did he simply punish him? Why didn't he kill him on the spot? Please describe these things if they relate to Lord Krishna. Bookmark that. Because we don't, we don't necessarily need to hear or see inauspicious things unless they have some benefit in terms of Shreyas. Shreyas means that thing which is ultimately super excellent, preeminently valuable and worthwhile and beneficial elevating. Uh, its opposite number given in the Upanishads is preya, is preyas, the thing which is immediately pleasing, or uh, the fast fast fix, whether it's a quick fix, we say. <laughs> you know, these things. So, <clears throat> the devotees of the Lord are accustomed to licking up the honey available from the lotus feet of the Lord. What is the use of topics which simply waste one's valuable life? In fact, Nadad Muni says elsewhere in this same canto that Whatever you choose to describe, if it's envisioned separate from the Lord, it simply serves to do what? No. To agitate the mind. It just agitates your mind. Now, people know this. Corporations know this. Advertisers know this. And the billboards that you're seeing every single day, that's a regular sadhana, isn't it? That's a regular ritual, isn't it? Every single day you go past this thing and see them. Um, <laughs> they're, they're, they're psychologically calculated to agitate your mind to get this product. They're, in, they're intent, they're, what is it? What is called Ugra Karma, actually. Krishna calls it in chapter 16. Unbeneficial, horrible acts. Kshayayo Jagato Hitaha. Unbeneficial acts meant to destroy the world. Well, they're not really meant to destroy the world per se, but they do destroy the world because they destroy everyone's purity, everyone's consciousness, every, the elevation of everyone's thought. Just like it used to be that India was a nice place. I can say this because I live there. And I always wanted to move to India, but once I moved to India, then I realized, hey, what happened? <laughs> Dude, where's my country? <laughs> right? Anybody know that one? Michael Moore? Anyway, so um, so it used to be that you would see something elevated there. Bhadram Karne Bhishranayama Deva. That's the one I was thinking of. And Pashyama Kshabhi, Yajatraha as well. You have to see things which are Bhadra, things which are auspicious. And now when you drive through Delhi, you see advertisements for, you know, hot paranthas. You're just appealing to the senses only. You know, and I went to one beautiful temple, Ananta Padmanabha Swami in Travandram. Anyone been there? Yeah, so you know, beautiful, beautiful temple. Very wonderful temple. And it used to be that the neighborhood around the temple was all the 
priests were living there, and it was very sattvic, very clean, very green also. And last time I went back there, it was a little discouraging because where, where, what happened to all the little cows? They used to have these diminutive cows walking around, the same kind that you, you find them in Udupi also, and you find them in Puri. Little cows, small cows, black usually. And uh, two places I noticed in India in 2004 that the cows were all gone. One of them is Kolkata, and the other one is Trivandrum. All the cows were gone. What do Kolkata and Trivandrum have in common? You guessed it. That's at least one thing. I don't know that this is, there's a causal, causal relationship there. I'm not going to make that, that uh, postulation. But in addition to this, what I saw all around that neighborhood that used to be very peaceful, quiet, sattvic, pure, green, it had built up and commercialized, and there were billboards everywhere advertising mainly jewelry and then other things also. So I don't know what happened there, but uh, this is the idea. This is the idea. The, once the mind is, is infected with material desire, chiefly through what we call kusanga in Sanskrit, bad association, asatsanga, because after all, where do, where do your desires come from? The things that come into our minds sometimes, it shocks us, especially what you dream about. Anybody have a dream that, how could I do this in a dream? Right? I had a dream that, uh, that I killed some creature sometime you know, in a dream. And I, where does it come from? It's coming from that vast repository of impressions called the mind, the antahakarana, the internal organ, which means the mind, the intelligence, and the ego altogether. And the mind has so many impressions. What's another word for these impressions in Sanskrit? Just like when you make an addition, it's called the samskarana. So the impression is called a samskara. Yeah, it's, the, it's what happens when you don't have samskrita. <laughs> when you're lacking samskriti, therefore, uh, you, you get bad samskaras. And the mind full of these samskars will not hesitate because that is what Krishna calls in Bhagavad Gita uh, Dvanva Moha in chapter 7, text 28. He says that those who are pious, those who stick with dharma against all the odds and in all circumstances, those who maintain dharma, they can sustain a mature and... Uh, well, they can sustain a commitment to pure devotional service. Other people may have difficulty if we're even concerned about devotional service at all, and many people aren't. But he says, When we are freed from the dwanva moha, the dual, the illusion of duality or the dualistic illusions that characterist that, that are that are nurtured and expanded and and, uh, you know, uh, contaminated by bad samskars. And bad samskars come from what? Where do, our, where do all, des all of our desires come from, aside from our own samskars? There are three kinds of contamination Srimad Bhagavatam mentions. Dravya, desha, atma, sambhava, doshas. This is in the 11th canto. So dravya dosha means you're working with bad facilities. The environment itself is, is, is contaminated. Everybody knows that. Uh, desha sambhava, from your social environment as well, right? That can also influence peer pressure, the kinds of things people do through peer pressure. And then there's atma sambhava, we've already mentioned. Atma sambhava means your samskars, the stuff, your baggage you've brought with us already from past lives. All three of these things, they can be wiped out through shravanam kirtanam, hearing and chanting about Lord Krishna, Hari. But if we don't do that, then what, what is the source of our desires? Aside from our own samskars, from the dravya and from the desha? What's a catch-all phrase that will describe this? Krishna actually does say it explicitly in Bhagavad Gita in chapter 2. Kama, sangat, sanjayate kama. Your desire will come from your sangha. And as we've already mentioned, sangha is a subtle term. It means... Basically, everything that is entering your organic senses 24-7. Uh, Especially if you live in the temple neighborhood, not the greatest neighborhood. Uh, even if you're asleep, the, 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 the sangha is going to enter your ears. Boom, 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 boom. 
You ever hear it? They drive by in the middle of the night, or you, you get uh, uh, El Musica del, Nor del Norteños, right? Listen. You also get that. But this is all Sangha. This is all part of Sangha. What you are hearing, what you are seeing, what you are tasting, smelling, touching, uh, you know, the ideas that are wafting through the, uh, what the Germans call Weltanschauungen, right? So many ideas are wafting through the air as the air carries aromas, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita. Anybody know that verse? Vayur Gantan Ivashayat. This is how we accept one body and give up that body and accept another body. All these different kinds of gross and subtle sangha. Now, if it's kusanga, if it's asat sangha, then uh, good luck. Good luck. Therefore, especially in this Kali Yuga, when all dharmas we, we chanted at the beginning, dharma, um, dharmadi visaha, all these things, uh, all the auspicious qualities, including dharma, they've all gone along with Lord Krishna. When he left, he took them all with him. Kali Yuga entered at that point. Now, Maharaj Parikshit, <clears throat> he intuited this, it would seem, because according to Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur and other commentators on this section, he says that the Maharaj was actually went out looking for trouble spots. He was a conscientious king. I have my duty. Now I've been enthroned as the king. I have to make sure that Dharma is flourishing in my kingdom. So he went out looking for Adharma. And it wasn't Lokaira Drishta, Sridhar Swami says. It wasn't visible to the people in general, but somehow he saw that this is going on in his kingdom. I don't know on what kind of subtle platform, it's not very clear to me, but this is what the Tikakaras have written. So, <clears throat> Maharaj Parikshit was out there, and um, he was prepared to punish this person. Anybody know quickly? We haven't got there yet, but why did he not kill him on the spot? Why did he, why did he punish him? Huh. Good guess. We'll leave it at that. Let's go on. O Sutta Goswami, there are those amongst men who desire freedom from death and get eternal life. They escape the slaughtering process by calling the controller of death Yamaraj. As long as Yamaraj, who causes everyone's death, is present here, no one shall meet with death. The great sages have invited the controller of death Yamaraj. They were performing a sacrifice. Remember the context? This is at Naimisharanya, and they were performing a thousand year sacrifice and discussing Bhagavatam. And Yamaraj, it said, was present there. How? How was Yamaraj present there? As Vidura, it's a good guess. I don't really know. I don't know the answer to this question. I, I tried to find the answer in the commentaries. I can't find it there either. But <clears throat> this is what they're saying. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's quite some time later. But it may be a play on words because the last uh, two lines of the verse, Ahon riloke pieta harili lamrta vachaha. Hari Lila Amrita Vacha. The Vacha itself is deathless nectar. Hari Lila Amrita Vacha. Amrita, what does Amrita mean? It means eternal. It also means nectar. But literally, what does it mean? Not dead. Amrita. Amrita means dead. Past, passive participle. So, lazy humans with paltry intelligence and a short duration of life past the night sleeping and the day performing activities that are for naught. There's a nice purport here also by Srila Prabhupada. This uh, chapter is 37 verses long, and we're already about a third of the way through it, so just hold on. The less intelligent do not know the real value of the human form of life. The human form is a special gift of material nature in the course of her enforcing stringent laws of miseries upon the living being. It is a chance to achieve the highest boon of life, namely to get out of the entanglement of repeated birth and death. Everybody knows, I don't think there's any argument in this room, the mortality rate is 100%. Everyone here will die. And maybe tonight, we don't really know. 
Maybe one of us or more than one of us will die tonight. Maybe not, that we don't know. Now, if I invite you to come and have a nice meal and you see there's nice sabzis and puris and pakora and halwa and sweet rice and nice chutneys and raita, papadam and so many things, sweets, endless varieties, uh, fried things, uh, healthy things also, whatever you want, it's all there. Please sit down and enjoy, and as soon as you start to eat, so that your senses are already attached and going at it, then I mentioned, by the way, there's a bomb under the table, and I don't know when it's set to go off. I mean, this is not the situation that we're in. Think about it. We don't really know when death is coming. That man who went to answer his door, just he had no idea that it was, he was going to die a minute later. He had no idea that it can happen. And, you know, sometimes if it happens that way, it's better. My father had spinal cancer. And he was spared because he was pious. But generally, that's a really ugly way to go. Because it eats its way up your spine and it really hurts. And you can't move. As soon as you move, it's just like excruciating. So that's another way to die. And many people, old age is like one of the quartet, isn't it? What are they? Janma? Krishna says one should sensibly, one should responsibly and intelligently consider the, the evil nature of a, of a situation in which this is what you have to deal with. Birth after birth after birth. So a human being, uh, a, a civilized, intelligent person who is also virtuous, honest at least, because honesty is the last... <laughs> the last leg of virtue that we have in this age. Uh, such a person can appreciate what the value of human life is. Tadapi adruvam, Prahlad Maharaj says, arthadam. Although it's temporary, it is very, very beneficial. Arthadam, it can give you a great advantage because you can get out of this habit of having to come back again. And God knows in what form. There's no guarantee. You may be an Iyengar now or, or, a, or a Chakravarti or whatever. But if you don't know what the future holds, depending on our karmas, and that's inscrutable, Krishna, Krishna himself tells us in Bhagavad Gita, it's impossible virtually to figure out the ins and outs of your karma. So there's no way to really tell what's happening in the future life unless you're so positively sinful that there's no question about it. And that's fairly common nowadays, isn't it? Um, America, I mean, this is, you know, I mean, most empires, they last two or 300 years. And... <laughs> By most accounts, America is now on its way out. Um, <clears throat> we can say the tank is empty, but it's, the, the vehicle is still running on the fumes <laughs> of piety that, was, that this country was founded on. So, <clears throat> yeah, we don't really know. It may be a human form. It may not be a human form. We just don't know. So this is the value of human form of life. It's very short, but we have enough intelligence to control the the animal nature that we share with the others, with the other species. And um, we can develop our consciousness such that we do not have to come back at all. But at least we don't have to come back as an animal or a suffering human. It's possible to do that much and we should, we should try. So this is the value of human life that uh, less fortunate people cannot appreciate. As Prabhupada's pointing out here. Now, Sutta Uvacha, text 10. He says, uh, while Maharaj Pariksit was residing in the capital of the Kuru Empire, the symptoms at the age of Kali began to infiltrate within the jurisdiction of his state. When he learned about this, he did not think the matter very palatable. This did, uh, this did however, give him a chance to fight. He took up his bow and arrows and prepared himself for military activities. Maharaj Pariksit sat on a chariot drawn by black horses. His flag was marked with the sign of a lion. Being so decorated and surrounded by charioteers, cavalry, elephants, and infantry soldiers, he left the capital to conquer in all directions. And we've already described this was not for the purpose of making him or his patrons uh, comfortable. Uh, nowadays, especially in Vrindavan, I would <laughs> go so far as to say uh, that is the chief purpose of government officers. Whatever the government touches, uh, it becomes useless in India. They, they mainly, they polish their shares, and if you try to get even from one end of Vrindavan to another, 
the road is so full of potholes that you're going to need a chiropractor, a very good one, by the time you get home. So <clears throat> this is because those who are actually in charge of taking care of this sort of thing are simply taking money, and God only knows where it's going, mostly south, it would seem. <clears throat> so Maharaj Parikshit then conquered all parts of the earthly planet, Bhadrashva, Ketumala, Bharata, the northern Kuru, Kimpurusha, etc., and exacted tributes from their respective rulers. Uh, whenever the, wherever the king visited, he continuously heard the glories of his great forefathers who were all devotees of the Lord and also the glorious acts of Lord Krishna. He also heard how he himself had been protected from the Lord, by the Lord from the powerful heat of the weapon of Ashwatthama. People also mentioned the great affection between the descendants of Rishni and Pratha due to the latter's great devotion to Lord Keshava. The king, being very pleased with the singers of such glories, these persons were called Vandis, Magadas, Bhutas, Vandis, their professional class who would versify any noble person's activities, and they, he would become celebrated in that way, kind of like uh, Facebook nowadays. The king, being very pleased with the singers of such glories, opened his eyes in great satisfaction. Out of magnanimity, he was pleased to award them very valuable necklaces and clothing. Maharaj Parikshit, uh, heard that out of his causeless mercy, Lord Krishna Vishnu, who is universally obeyed, rendered all kinds of service to the malleable sons of Pandu by accepting posts ranging from chariot driver to president to messenger, friend, night watchman, etc., according to the will of the Pandavas. What do we call this in Sanskrit? Bhaktavatsalya. He loves his devotees. He will even become the servant of his devotees. Obeying them like a servant and offering obeisances is like one younger in years. When he heard this, Maharaj Parishi became overwhelmed with devotion to the lotus feet of the Lord. Now you may hear from me what happened while Maharaj Parishi was passing his days hearing of the good occupations of his forefathers and being absorbed in thought of them. The personality of religious principles dharma was wandering about in the form of a bull. Bull represents dharma. Mark that. And this is what Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur and other commentators on the Bhagavatam, they say that he, this is what he intuited. It wasn't visible to others, but he, he somehow in his meditation, what was the word used? Yoga netrataha or something to that effect. From the, from the eyes of yoga, he was able to see this. Um, and he met the personality of earth, that is to say the bull met the personality of earth in the shape of? A cow, because the cow is feminine, like the earth. Bhumi means feminine. Interesting, another word for uh, earth begins with D-H. Anybody know what I'm thinking? Dharati, Dharati. What does Dharati mean? She bears, she upholds it. Now, where do, what does Dharma mean? That which upholds you. They both come from the same verbal root. So Dharma and Dharati. So we just have some idea of the relationship of this earth planet to dharma. Very close. In fact, those who are conscientious Brahmins, when they wake up in the first, the first thing in the morning, you probably know this one, what do they say? Prithvitvaya dhrita loka. Right? My dear Bhumi Devi, please forgive me for touching you with my foot. You are, the, you are upholding all the worlds. You are the wife of Lord Vishnu. And I have to put my foot on you first thing in the morning. This is Dharati. So, um, he, met the, he met the bull of Dharma and the earth personified as a cow. And the cow was grieving like a mother who had lost her child. What's the word used here? Um, Vichayam upalabhyagam. And the commentators all say this means, you know, something like pranashta vatsam gam, the cow who has lost her calf. She had tears her eyes in, in her eyes and the beauty of her body was lost. Thus, Dharma questioned the earth as follows. So the bull of Dharma questioned the earth personified as a cow. He said, Madam, are you not hale and hearty? Why are you covered with the shadow of grief? It appears by your face that you have become black. Are you suffering from some internal disease? Or are you thinking of some relative who is away in a far, a far away place? 
I've lost the, the, the cow answers. I'm sorry, the bull explains. I've lost my three legs, and I'm now standing on one only. Anybody understand what does this mean? The bull of Dharma was standing on one leg only, and three legs had been uh, broken by this Kali. What are those legs? Mercy, cleanliness, austerity. Those three legs were broken, and the one remaining leg of Dharma, which was still functional, was? Therefore, I say, if we are honest, with ourselves and you cannot be honest with anyone else <laughs> until you're honest with yourself if we have at least honesty then there's some hope therefore kali yuga not all is finished there's still some hope all we have to be is honest and surrender okay. <clears throat> so he says i'm standing on three legs only are you lamenting for my state or are you always in great anxiety because henceforward the unlawful meat eaters will exploit you Henceforward, consider this was spoken perhaps 5,000 years ago. Henceforward, the unlawful meat eaters will exploit you. And we see this wholesale nowadays. Not just uh, murgi or any other animals. It's pretty much anything people will eat, including mother cow. So are you in a sorry plight because the demigods are now bereft of their share of sacrificial offerings? Because no sacrifices are being performed at present. I like to say in California, where I'm living currently, they get wildfires every summer. Because nobody's giving anything to Agni, he comes and takes whatever he wants and eats to his con full content. There's lots of stuff to eat there if you're the fire god. So, <clears throat> or are you grieving for living beings because of their sufferings due to famine and drought? There's a long, long purport here that I wish I could read, but I'm just in the interest of time, I'm going to have to skip it. Are you feeling compunction for the unhappy women and children who are left forlorn by unscrupulous persons? Do we see this nowadays? Right here in Texas, we see this. What part of Texas? I mentioned it the other day. Let's see if you're sharp enough to remember. How about Ciudad Juarez? You know about this? Hundreds of, hundreds, maybe thousands of women disappearing for... Uh, it has to be at least 10, 20 years now. And no matter who you ask, nobody has any answers. We don't know what it is. Ask the people who live in the neighborhood. No, no, we didn't see anything. Ask the government. No, no, we don't know what, it's, what, what it is. Ask the police. No, no, we don't know. Mexican side, they also don't know. Factory owners, they don't know. Everybody has a motive to, 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 to remain choop, right? Everybody can stay quiet. Hmm? Therefore, John F. Kennedy, uh, there's a nice quote. He said, the hottest places in hell are reserved, especially for those persons who in a time of crisis do nothing. This is Kali Yuga. The honesty is lacking. We, we can see, we can understand, but we're not going to say anything. Okay. So this thing is being mentioned here in the first canto. Women and children who are left forlorn and you have to pay for it through your taxes. Somebody has to take care of them. Therefore, the welfare state does that. It's not like what goes around doesn't come back around again. So you get what you pay for. Um, this is the idea. Or are you unhappy because the goddess of learning is being handled by brahmanas addicted to acts against the principles of religion? Because this also happens. When I was in college, I was studying South Asian language and literature. That means Sanskrit, also Braj Pasha, other regional and, and NIA languages. And it was understood because of the proximity, at least with uh, MIA languages, medieval Indo-Aryan languages, and, and religion of the medieval period. It was understood that everyone there knew all about bhakti, they knew all about the books and, and, and the teachings of Srila Prabhupada and, and Vaishnava charges, but it was understood that these things have no bearing on the, on the quality of education that we're able to impart. Okay. Secular, very secular. You, you kind of have to be. In fact, about 10 years ago, the American Academy of Religion, they had a few conferences about this topic of scholars who are also practitioners of Eastern faiths. And it was pretty much agreed, at least in private communications that I was privy to on, like, uh, what do they call that? Uh, 
uh, Indology list, and there was another one, I forget the name, Risa list, uh, <clears throat> that you can be a Buddhist, and that's pretty much okay with everyone. Like Tina Turner is a Buddhist, if that gives you a hint of what's going on. So that's pretty cool if you're a Buddhist. And uh, of course, if you're a Christian, nobody's going to say anything, although it's a little weird. Um, if you are a practicing Hindu, well, wait a minute. <laughs> that's like really over the top. Is it not a fact? It seems like that. At least that was also my experience. So anyway, don't want to get too much in, into that, but uh, Brahmins are addicted to the, the intellectuals, the persons who should be the most virtuous, the instructors, those who are training up the next generation. They have a responsibility to actually in, 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 uh, inspire the younger generation to become moral persons because what is the purpose of education if not morality? Education sans morality, sans ethical principles, becomes uh, just a tool for exploitation. That's what we see. So he's asking, the bull of Dharma is asking this earth in the shape of the cow, are you lamenting because of this? Finally, he says, <clears throat> are you sorry to see that the Brahmins have taken shelter of administrative families that do not respect Brahminical culture? The so-called administrators are now bewildered by the influence of the age of Kali, and thus they have put all state affairs into disorder. Are you now lamenting this? Now the general populace does not follow the rules and regulations for eating, sleeping, drinking, mating, etc. And they're inclined to perform such anywhere and everywhere. Are you unhappy because of that? O Mother Earth, the Supreme Personality of Godhead Hari, incarnated himself as Lord Sri Krishna just to unload your heavy burden. Just to unload your heavy burden, Krishna came and now he's gone and you're crying. All his activities here are transcendental and they cement the path of liberation. Are you now, uh, you are now bereft of his presence. Are you, uh, and you're probably now thinking of those activities and feeling worry in their absence, mother. You are the reservoir of all riches. Please inform me of the root cause of your tribulations by which you have been re reduced to such a weak state. I think that the powerful influence of time, which conquers the most powerful, might have forcibly taken away all your fortune, which was adored even by the demigods. Now, <clears throat> she's called Tarani here. means the same thing as Tarati. Tarani Uvacha. O Dharma, wherever you, whatever you have in, uh, inquired from me, it shall now be known to you. I shall try to reply to all those questions. Once, you too were maintained by your four legs, and you increased happiness all over the universe by the mercy of the Lord. Then she goes into a wonderful list of qualities that the Lord possesses and that the Lord encourages in all who come in contact with him. In him reside truthfulness, cleanliness, uh, intolerance of another's unhappiness, the power to control anger, self-satisfaction, straightforwardness, steadiness of mind, control of the sense organs, responsibility, equality, tolerance, equanimity, faithfulness, knowledge, absence of sense enjoyment, leadership, chivalry, influence, the power to make anything possible, the discharge of proper duty, Complete independence, dexterity, fullness of all beauty, serenity, kind-heartedness, ingenuity, gentility, magnanimity, determination, perfection in all knowledge, proper execution of duty, possession of all objects of enjoyment, uh, joyfulness, immovability, fidelity, fame, worship, pridelessness, and being as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and eternity and many other transcendental qualities which are eternally present and never to be separated from him. That personality of Godhead, the reservoir of all goodness and beauty, Lord Sri Krishna, has now closed his transcendental pastimes on the face of the earth. In his absence, the age of Kali has spread its influence everywhere, and so I am sorry to see this condition of existence. So he guessed right. Again, there's a long purport that we're going to have to skip over. She continues, I'm thinking about myself and, uh, and also, O oh best of the demigods, about you, as well as about all the demigods, sages, denizens of Pitraloka, devotees of the Lord, and all men obedient to the system of Varna and Ashram in human society. 
In other words, she's thinking about all persons dharmic. Finally, she says, Lakshmi Ji, the goddess of fortune, whose glance of grace was sought by demigods like Brahma, and for whom they surrendered many a day unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, this Lakshmi, she gave up her own abode in the forest of lotus flowers and engaged herself in the service of the lotus feet of the Lord. Actually, this is confirmed by many odd charges, including it brings divine, because the same word is used, Yadapanga Moksha Kama, her sidelong glance. Madhvacharya also wrote an ice verse. He says, I offer my respectful obeisances unto that inconquerable Supreme Lord, by whose Lakshmi potency the demigods have all been empowered with so many things. What are they? The, the power to create to maintain, to destroy, to get along, vritti, um, uh, control of the universe, uh, niyama, avritti, covering, people get covered over by his maya energy as well, uh, bondage, liberation, all these things are affected by the powerful glance of Sri, who is the beloved of, consort of Ajita, Lord Vishnu. So she says, the earth goddess, uh, Bhubi Devi, in the form of a cow, she continues, I was endowed with spe specific powers to supersede the fortune of all the three planetary systems by being decorated with the impressions of the flag, thunderbolt, elephant driving rod, and lotus flower, which are the signs of the lotus feet of the Lord. But at the end, when I felt I was so fortunate, the Lord left me. So she's feeling separation. O personality of religion, I was greatly overburdened by the undue military phalanxes arranged by atheistic kings and I was relieved by the grace of the Personality of Godhead. Similarly, you were also in a distressed condition, weakened in your standing strength, and thus he also incarnated by the, his internal energy in the family of the Yadus to relieve you. Who, therefore, can tolerate the pangs of separation from that Supreme Personality of Godhead? He could conquer the gravity and passionate wrath of his sweethearts, sweethearts like Satyabhama, by his sweet smile of love, pleasing, a gl pleasing glance and hearty appeals. When he traversed my earth's surface, I would be immersed in the dust of his lotus feet and would, thus, and would be sumptuously covered with grass which appeared like hairs standing upon me out of ecstasy due to his presence. You get the, the, the poetic metaphor here? All the grass is growing just like hair standing on end because the Lord's soft lotus feet are touching the bumi. Bumi surface, Bhutale. Uh, finally, the last verse. Actually, in this edition, there's 36 verses. Uh, While the earth and the personality of religion were thus engaged in conversation, the saintly king Parikshit reached the shore of the Saraswati River, which flowed toward the east. Toward the east. Anybody know of the Saraswati River? Where's Saraswati River? Yeah. Is it? Yeah, that's right. They, there's no, there's no, we don't see it generally. There's no in that area. There are many Saraswati rivers. In, in Mayapur, there's a Saraswati as well. Um, but this Saraswati, Sridhar Swami has uh, confirmed that it's actually a river that's flowing in Kurukshetra and it flows eastward. So um, that same, there are many different Saraswatis but that's the one that's being referred to here. It's not clear from the text, but I should say that. Now, I think it was Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur commenting on text 35. He says that Bhumi Devi was feeling that although the Lord's consorts, they would have the Lord's association generally only in the evening because during the day he was busy with Dwarka affairs or maybe he was out of town even. So they sometimes did not get his association. But Bhumi Devi, because she's the earth, <laughs> Dharati, the Lord's lotus feet were in constant contact with her, except maybe when he was asleep at night. But uh, this, is, this is the idea. So now she's really feeling separation, and she's um, 
she's lamenting like this. Things are so horrible now that Krishna has left. Kali Yuga has entered in full swing, and I'm missing Krishna. This is what Bhumi Devi is saying in the form of this cow, to the bull of dharma. Now, <clears throat> the Acharyas have not really said a whole lot about the verses in this chapter, but Srila Prabhupada has written some absolutely stunning purports to these verses, probably um, precipitated by the unprecedented decadence that we see in this age. The, 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 you have to consider most of these commentaries were written four or five hundred years ago. Things are a lot worse now than they were four or five hundred years ago, in case uh, you haven't guessed that. As I mentioned earlier, things are a lot worse now than they were four or five decades ago when I grew up. So who can imagine about centuries ago? Um, anybody have any questions or comments on any of this so far? Basically, just read the whole chapter. And, uh, you know, we can kind of explain anything if it's not clear, if anybody has any questions or anything that we want to discuss further. Yeah, these women are disappearing at an alarming rate, and no one is alarmed. <laughs> so it, it would seem that uh, they're being wasted. Uh, they actually, they do find them regularly buried out in the desert, but nobody really has any answers as to why they're being killed, whether it's the drug trade or whether... Does anybody know uh, what the global economy is now for human trafficking? It's in the billions. It's huge. It's like, you know, it's not, it's all under the table, of course, but this is like the second strongest economy in the world based largely on pornography and prostitution and other kinds of ugly, uh, pungent activities. Ugra karma, basically. But women are not only being kidnapped from places like Nepal or Croatia or um, other places where you might suspect, they're being kidnapped in neighborhoods like this one. And they're get, being held in, uh, quote unquote, safe houses in neighborhoods like this one here in North America in the United States. And they're being held as slaves, sexual slaves or, or whatever. It's not just Thailand. It's everywhere. So, including Ciudad Juarez, because the women come from all over South America, naive young women, especially looking for a job, and if you can work for an AFTA corporation, that's a very appealing thing. You have this a foot in the door on your way to America, kind of like the call centers in India, <laughs> isn't it? They've had riots about those as well for very similar reasons. They're basically sweatshops, and it's basically slave labor, and uh, all these unsavory things happen to these poor women who are unprotected. So the Bull, the, the bull of religion is asking the cow of the earth, and she's saying, yeah, this is going on. Even 5,000 years ago, this sort of thing was possible, although not so prominent as it is today. Does that answer your question? You can look, you Google it if you need more information, but uh, don't spend too much time. <laughs> is that okay? And you had a question? There's, there's maybe an exoteric reason and there's also an esoteric reason. The exoteric reason is that this Kali in the form of the Shudra later surrendered to the king. He bowed down and because he bowed down to the king, the king, there he, therefore he's one of the prajas of the king. He had to be protected by the king. The internal reason is that this whole pastime had to play itself out so that the Srimad Bhagavatam could be spoken as we're hearing it tonight. That's my answer. There may be others, but I'm not aware. Okay. Anything else? What is the time? Eight eleven. Any other questions? Yeah. Last, uh, last week, actually, uh, there was a, a story that you mentioned, and not story, uh, was about uh, the South Indian Brahmins who are in piety, they are happy in their Mm. Um, in the way of, you know, doing their seva and other things. In Urubi or in Urubi as well? Yeah. I wanted to ask this question, but I didn't get a chance. But, uh -huh. um, so my question was that, if, why is it bad that, you know, that they are in the state of happiness? Because even for them, the threefold material misery is still full. So you said that's a dangerous situation. We don't realize the urgency of 
calling yeah. out names. So how does that really become a bad situation? Well, let's look in chapter 14 of Bhagavad Gita. Chapter 14 is entitled uh, Gunatraya Vibhaga. It deals with the different uh, modes of material nature. And when Krishna is discussing those various modes, he says, Sattva mridas tamaiti gunaha prakatasam bhavaha nibarhnanti mahabaho dehe dehe namavyayam. The embodied living beings are conditioned, they're bound by material nature in the form of these three modes, goodness, passion, and ignorance, sattva, rajas, and tamas. And he, by way of defining each of them a little bit more, he says, Sattva sattvam nirnamalatvat prakashakamanamayam Sukha Sangina Bhatnati, Gnana Sangina Chanaka. There are two ways that the mode of goodness gets you. It's actually the most insidious of the modes in this way. It gets you by dint of the fact that when you behave and are situated in, in solidly in, in Sattva Guna, you become very happy. You become, and then the, of course, the, the first cousin of happiness is complacence. <laughs> so Sukha Sangina Bhatnati, Gnana Sangina Chanaka. O sinless one, it also binds you by knowledge, because knowledge is dangerous too, in the sense that if you stay on the platform only of knowledge and don't progress to the platform of bhakti, not only does your knowledge remain theoretical, or I should say, better yet, hypothetical, instead of practical, and so eventually you mess up and fall down, but you become proud very proud of what you know and, and you begin you look down on other people and uh, as the Bible even they know that uh, pride precedes the fall <laughs> you see so it's a mixed blessing to be solidly situated in the mode of goodness because uh, we become complacent we become very happy and we lose all the intensity and the sense of urgency to get out of this ugly ugly world wherein the next time around you could be working in a maquiladora in Ciudad Juarez instead and God only knows how you meet your end there, you see? If you're even a human being at all, you see? Brahmins also blow it. There's Shakespeare said, there's many a slip twixt the cup and the lip. <laughs> you see? Does that answer your question? So this is from Krishna in chapter 14, and also another good place to look for further information is the verses of chapter 17. They both deal with these three modes and how they condition us. Okay? Yes, Arima D. Uh, after hearing all these things, uh, we really are grounded here on earth because of our own essential nature, which is a combination of um, Satya, Raja, and Tamas. Sometimes Tamas getting more prominence than the mm. other two Gunas. And uh, even as we are, uh, uh, what is, the, is there any way out of this visible existence? Or if there is, what is that way? You know, I'm really glad you raised this question because this is the unfinished, this is the conclusion to my unfin otherwise unfinished class. You know, we've, we've, we've read how horrible the age of Kali is, and we pointed out a few examples of what we're reading about in the current context. Um, and of course, we're hearing that Bhumi Devi in the form of this cow is just lamenting her, her, her lost association with the Lord. And so maybe we feel a little sorry for her, but we'll, what do we do about this? What's, what's the take home with this? Well, there's one very fortunate thing. That means that although this Kali Yuga is like an ocean of all kinds of flaws, and we mentioned in the beginning, dosha means flaw, right? Dosha isn't just what you eat. Uh, dosha means a flaw so the Kali Yuga is like an ocean of flaws and we've mentioned that some of those are flaws that we're bringing from our last life where the animalistic residue of our previous samskars is still very much with us and, and permeating our psyche where the environment that we're trying to work in is contaminated where the, where the social influences are also um, uh, you know uh, destructive uh, even we can say, I think, pretty safely. Um, these are all the flaws. So the Kali Yuga is like an ocean of all this problem. And we've just touched the tip of the iceberg here. Believe me, if you had read Srila Prabhupada's purports, I wish we had more time to do so. He really drives on how these things are applying where, and it's quite clear in his 
I mean, there's nothing about Srila Prabhupada that's not absolutely clear. Let's just put it that way. I think everybody here knows that. But um, one easy thing, although it's an ocean of flaws, uh, Srimad Bhagavatam says, is that although we have to deal with so much trash and so much negativity and have to slash our way out of this somehow, we do have the means of doing so, and that is Krishna Kirtan. By chanting the holy name of Krishna, not even Kirtan will be liberal. If you're even chanting personal japa quietly, that's also cool. You can do that, and it will be very, very effective. Harer nama, harer nama, harer nama, eva kevalam kalau nastyeva, nastyeva, nastyeva gatiranyatha. In school, you're a teacher, you know. If something is written on the board once, that means it's going to be on the test. And if something is written on the board three times, you really better know that. You see? So this is, in, throughout the Vedic literatures, we find, on many occasions, that the thing is stated three times like this. Now, we also have what we call in logic, nyaya. It's called anvaya vyatireki. That means positive and negative pervasion at the same time. Whenever you get an, an, a, a vidhi, a, an injunction or an order, there's also a nishedha given, a, a prohibition. So it's positive. You, you cover all your bases in, in modern parlance, we might say. So that's given here. Um, there, you, you should chant the holy name. This is the easy way to get all perfection, and you should not try anything else. <laughs> Another way this is stated in the Vishnu Purana by Parashran Muni, a uh, famous book among the Sri Vaishnavas, is that smartav yam satatam vishnur this smartavnam najatuchit. At no time should you forget Vishnu, and at all times you should remember Vishnu. So we know how to do this now. Simply chant the holy name. It's so easy. It's, it doesn't really even require a brain, <laughs> although it's helpful. And, and Srimad Bhagavatam is there for people who have brains. But we're, we're all described in the Bhagavatam itself as manda sumanda mati. Manda means what? Yeah, soft. Soft brain, little weak, dim, you know, whatever, dimwit. When Sumandamati, you might say dimwit. So, all we have to do is chant. But we have to chant with sincerity. That's the thing. And if we do that, if we call out to Krishna with sincerity, just see the result. This is my invitation. I, I do, I'll even say this is a challenge. If you chant with all your heart to Krishna, you can do it in a private room where nobody sees you. You don't have to, you, you can be a closet Krishna, as we might say. Um, if you do this, you will see the result. Krishna will become so happy. He will respond. He will, he will, he will reciprocate. This is the experience of every devotee. And it's not the experience of non-devotees only because they're not willing to do it. It's so easy. Huh? Mukunda Mala Stotra by Kula Shekhar uh, Alwar. He says, it's, it's as if people are just eager for their own undoing. It's so easy, the process of chanting the holy name, but nobody chants. Navakti Kashchit, he says. Anybody can chant, but nobody does. So that is the process in this day and age. And there are innumerable other references. I could go on all night reciting them, uh, but you've heard many of them, I think. So enough said. Is that okay? Thank you. Very nice question. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, one thing that's very common in all religion that they uh, they believe that their faith is the only faith, and even Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is saying that uh, you know Sarva Dharma Parite Dharma Bhutam Sarnam You know Christ also. I think he told like that, and the Islam believer they also think like that. No question. So why this statement has been repeated everywhere? that you know why christ told that i am the only way why krishna is saying that i am only way if if that's the statement you know either given by god himself yeah. or given by the prophet who are the messenger of god why you know this uh, that statement was kind of repeated and you know <laughs> told you know again and again in different uh, circumstances completely contradictory situation going from one to another but that statement was there yeah. yeah. So, I mean, what is the message? What goes? Uh, every religion says theirs is the only way, and we can see that practically every religion contradicts every other religion. So, what's the story? What are we supposed to do about this? Very good question. It's a perennial question. It's been answered by Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. If you've read his 
new biography called Bhakti Siddhanta Vaibhava, written by Bhakti Vikas Maharaj. It's an excellent book. I highly recommend it. It was a, a addressed by Srila Prabhupada. I've also answered it in many ways. Um, uh, tonight, what I can say is that, <clears throat> well, somebody asked Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, is Gaudiya Mutt the only way? <laughs> So, you know, people often ask us also, as you feel, do you think that Hare Krishna is gone is the only way? And the quick answer is yes. <laughs> I will say that unabashedly. However, someone who does not see his own religion and another person's religion most likely does not appreciate his own religion very deeply. That has to be said. So, the, there are, in, in any religious process, if it's scientific, and not every religion has a scientific process, mind you. In my opinion, for what it's worth, uh, it's worth whatever I'm worth, but uh, in my opinion, I've seen that uh, Abrahamic faiths in general do not have a very systematic scientific process, uh, unlike Krishna consciousness, or at least it's not as systematic or as scientific or uh, gaugeable, really, as, as Krishna consciousness is. For example, Rupa Goswami says one has to go through some 13 or 14 stages, beginning with Shraddha and ending in Prema, love of Godhead. Shraddha, what is the verse? Anybody know? Adau Shraddha Tata Sadhu Sangha Atha Bhajana Kriya Anartha Nevriti Syat So Nishtas Tato Bhava no, I'm sorry, after Nishta becomes Ruchi and then Asakti, attachment then Bhava and Prema. You see, these in each of these stages is further subdivided into many, many categories that have been um, in, in hair splitting detail analyzed so carefully for us by the previous acharyas, especially acharyas such as Bhaktivinoda Thakur about 100 years ago. So it's a very, very scientific process. That said, the same essential truth can be found in Christianity, it can be found in Islam, it can be found in Judaism or uh, there's so many religions in the world. Hmm? Whether they are found in those religions is a, is, a, is a social convention or a political convention more than anything else, isn't it? And we have to be very careful that people cannot say the same thing about Krishna consciousness. Because the only thing that is preventing Krishna consciousness from becoming a watered-down parody of itself is the commitment that we display practically in our own lives. I joined ISKCON because I could see here is a person who is actually, well, as the, as the Shruti Mantra describes, Shrotriyam Brahmanishtam, not only well-versed and repeating verbatim and, 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 and without any adulteration what he's heard from the Shruti and from the Smriti, but he's also Brahmanishtam. He, his, his activities, his life is actually fixed in this wisdom and understanding. Therefore, he has not only Gyan, but Vigyan, and is able to empathize with all living entities in, in all circumstances, and can present Krishna consciousness in the most convincing way. My priests were not able to satisfy my questions. I was raised a Roman Catholic. They were not able, able to satisfy my, my questions the way that Srila Prabhupada did. Therefore, I accepted Krishna consciousness. And the Srimad Bhagavatam, actually, Although I just told you that Krishna consciousness is the only way, the Srimad Bhagavatam doesn't actually say that. The Srimad Bhagavatam says what? Savai Pung Sam. Yayatma Suprasidati. It's a very non sectarian statement of the, of the essential characteristic that, that, that one seeks in a religious process. Those characteristics are Savai Pung Sam Paro Dharma Yato Bhaktir Arhokshije. Whatever it takes to get bhakti for adhoksha, adhoksha, the transcendental Lord, whatever it takes. Now, this comes to the second part of your question, which is about contradictions. And we find in the Mahabharata, a very, very famous and uh, convincing verse, Tarako apratishta shrutayo vibhinna na savrashir yasyamatam na bhinnam. You cannot be established as a professor as it were, whether in the ac academic environment or in, or in spiritual life, you will not be established as a rishi unless you have your own something to say, something new, something different. You have to write your dissertation. You see? Otherwise, who wants to, why, why should we listen to you? Unless you've actually made a statement that's, that's unique and valuable. 
You see? But the problem is that everybody has his own opinion. And which one is, the, you know, that, how do you judge? Even if you go to the Shrutis, as you pointed out very correctly, not to speak of the Smritis, the Shrutis themselves, it would seem they are full of contradictions. Huh? And Tarko is, uh, therefore, Tarko Apratishta. Tarko is baseless. <laughs> Argument alone is, is, has no foundation. The floor has been removed from beneath it. Just like our, our postmodern and existentialist friends like to, uh, like to assure us. <laughs> there really is no, I mean, everything is relative in, in that sense. So, dharmasya tattvasya nehitam guhayam. The real truth of religion is hidden within the heart of whom? Mahajano. Yena gatasa panta. Therefore, whatever path he has advised, that is the path we follow. So it doesn't matter that Shankaracharya or that Madhvacharya differs from Vallabhacharya and says something different than, than uh, Ramanujacharya or Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, or for that matter, Jesus Christ or Muhammad or Buddha or whatever. That's a secondary consideration. If by following whatever instructions they give you, you can become elevated out of the bodily concept of life and develop love of Godhead, then that's fine. You don't have an argument with it. That said, I will also remind you that some so-called religions, they are not religions, strictly speaking. They're called, what do they call them? Gnosticas in Sanskrit language. And that may not, this is not G-N-O-S-T-I-C. <laughs> this is, this is N-A-S-T-I-K-A. -A. It's a different word altogether. Astikya means somebody who accepts the authority of the Vedas and is a theist. A Gnostic is somebody who says, no, 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 I don't accept your Vedas. And that's Buddhism. That's the Jainas. That's the Ajivikas. Technically speaking, there's no God in these systems. In fact, in Buddhism in particular, although it's considered to be religion, there's not even, a, there's no you, <laughs> even. There's no you, even. There's no soul, an Atman. This is the rubric. So one has to bookmark that and keep it in mind when we're talking about the oneness of all religions. See, when, 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 when I'm talking about religion, we're, we're talking about theism in its various forms. So whatever it takes. And, and we do find that those who are sincere in any religion, they do become elevated. They do develop very, I mean, some of the things that were written by Christian mystics and others, they're very profound. Jews, Jews as well. I mean, what to speak of that, uh, you know, in Hinduism, one of the unique characteristics is we have the impersonal understanding, Brahma, Brahmavad, Sakshat, uh, Brahma, uh, what is it, Parokshanubhuti, you know, direct experience. Having read uh, T.S. Eliot's Four Quartet, I'm going to make the bold statement that this gentleman had a lot of realization of Brahman, it would seem. And certainly because he quotes Krishna there, he, I'm sure he read our books. He knew Sanskrit, but it goes without saying. So these are some things we can think about. All right, anything else? Please. So, Bajamiham actually translates to worship. Mm -hmm. So as we get closer, does he mean he will give us, I mean, I don't understand how it is. <coughs> is Krishna going to worship me? I mean, I don't want that, but is that what he's? Yeya tam maam prapadyante tans tataiva bhajamiyaham mama varthma anu varthante manushyaha partha sarvasha. That one. But that's, what does that got to do with bhajami? The, the word bhajami is there. Okay. So I was wondering, my Sanskrit is not, I, I don't know, but I'm. Yeah, tam tans tataiva bhajamiyaham. Yeah, I, I, mm, you know, without looking at the commentary, I don't want to make it just, you know, from my understanding of the Siddhanta, what I can say is that Pajami in that sense probably means partake or I share with him, something like that, because... It's, I reward them accordingly. Yeah, so reward, maybe sharing, it's Paj, is the, is the, it's like we talk about Bhaga, right? Bhaga means a division, so it's kind of like that. It all comes, bhaj is, you know, many of these Sanskrit words, they have many meanings. So bhaj is one of them. Yuj is the one we were discussing this morning also. It means to join or to link or to yoke or, you know, they're, they're kind of hard. In, in certain contexts, they, they don't always have the same meaning. So yeah, it, it, I, you know. However, we've already mentioned in this chapter that Krishna does on occasion worship his devotees. But that's love. 
because all's fair in love and war. So there's nothing to say that Krishna cannot worship his devotee. He does so all the time. Okay? That's Bhaktivatsalya. Okay? And... The Mangala article there, where this word bhaja comes twice. Mm. And one of the places I remember it is translated as feels. Feels. Well, bhajata actually means distributing prasadam. Are you thinking of chapter of verse 4? Chatur vidha shri bhagavat prasado, tvadvanna triptam, haribhakta sangan, tritvaiva triptim bhajata sadaiva. Yeah, that, that means distribution, because bhajanam also means distribution. Uh, what was the other reference? On the same prayer, there is one more. Uh, I don't remember it often. In I don't think so. Anybody can think of this? Another place in Gurvashtakam? Bhaja? No? Not not in the second verse either. Mahaprabhu Kirtana Ratya Gita Varitra Madhyan Manasura Sena. Tomancha Kampashru Abhajo, yeah. Saranga Bhajo. Participating. Yeah. Again, I would say participating, it sounds like. Because Bhajanam is distribution as well as participation. This is pretty trivial. Yeah. Well, this is his argument. I mean, this is the in a bhakti context. This is the this is the primary understanding of the word. Well, you can say that also. Yeah, I, I I'm not going to argue with that. But uh, yeah, it depends. Yeah. Distributing prasadam. Okay, anything else? Thank you very much for taking your time, for coming tonight and listening so patiently. Appreciate it. All glory to Srila Prabhupada.